Good morning. Good to see you guys. Uh, if I haven't met you, my name is Adam, and I'm the campus pastor here at our Corona campus. And uh, going to get a chance to talk with you today as we wrap up this series we've been in for two months. One of the longest series we've ever done uh, called The Thing Behind the Thing. But before we dive into this today, a couple things I just wanted to mention. One is uh, in our announcement video, we talked about the group's brochures on your chairs. And some of you are like, wait, what's going on? Where, where is it? And uh, it is not there. You're not losing your mind. Uh, they did not arrive in time, and so we were not able to put them out. But all of our groups are currently up on the Church Center app, and that is the best place to sort of browse and uh, RSVP for the group that you want to be in. And so many incredible groups, including Rooted and Bible Studies and uh, men's and women's groups, all that sort of stuff. And so make sure you take a peek at that today and we'll get you a brochure next week. For those of you that are like, I don't internet, and that's fine. Uh, we'll get a brochure next week to you. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention is this uh, neon hot tub over here. Uh, that is because uh, it is the last Sunday of the month, and that means baptisms for us. And so we're going to baptize some people today. And uh, we, we have a handful of people that have signed up ahead of time in each of our services, and we cannot wait to celebrate um, this next step of their faith. You know, we believe that baptism is sort of this uh, outward expression of this inward decision you've made to make Jesus the center of your life. And uh, nobody can see sort of the things that go on inside of your heart. And so um, God gives us these sort of practical symbols so that we can celebrate together to communicate to everybody like, my life has changed, my priorities have shifted this is what I'm about, and, um, and so we're so excited about that, and I want to tell you, if you did not sign up, but like anywhere during this message or this, uh, this service today that you're just like, man, I wish I would have signed up, I, I'm really feeling like this is something I need to do. This is the next step that I've been stalling on. I've given my life to Christ. I've said yes to Jesus, but I haven't been baptized. We've got room for you today, um, and in fact, if you just, we, you never do this in search, but if you turn and look towards the back, uh, right there, there are a couple ladies sitting at a table next to a sign that says, want to get baptized? Um, they're the ladies that can help you make that happen, and so um, we will spontaneously baptize you today. Even if you didn't sign up, you can just walk back there. They'll make sure you get everything that you need. They've got a t-shirt for you. Uh, they'll walk you through what, what it means. Um, they'll get you all set, and in fact, we've got over here, you can see this little clothing rack. We've got tons of t-shirts and towels and we've got breath mints and mouthwash and underarm deodorant, like whatever you think that you're going to need in order to make this happen, we have thought of in advance, okay? And so we've got it all arranged for you. Don't let today, if you're feeling like, man, this is my day, don't let it go by. Um, and uh, that's going to be happening at the very end of the service today. So we're very excited. So with that said, uh, we are going to close out this series today that we've been in um, called The Thing Behind the Thing, Why Everyone Does Everything They Do. And uh, we've been talking through and teaching through the, the seven primal questions um, that really are essentially are sort of these, these uh, subconscious needs that we maybe didn't get met as kids. And because of our personality and the way that we're configured, it sort of left this longing in our heart, and it drives a lot of the things that we do in ways that we're not always aware. And so when we can sort of uncover what that is for ourselves and for the people around us, uh, A, we can give ourselves and them a little bit more grace, and we can also identify how to connect that question to God, because really he's the only one who can fully and finally answer it for us. And it changes the way that we approach everything when we understand how to take it to him. And so uh, today we are going to answer or talk about uh, the last of these uh, seven questions. And I want to encourage you to take some notes, write down some things that stand out to you that uh, you're just like, that's interesting. Um, I haven't thought about that. Or man, I know who this person is uh, because somebody is sitting here being like, this person is you. Okay, so, um, and regardless, even if this isn't your question, how many of you noticed that there is something in each of these messages that still applies to you, right? And you're just like, how many of you are convinced you all have all of the questions. You're just like, I don't, I took the test, but I, apparently I have seven problems, not one. Um, so I really need Jesus and, uh, you are correct. Um, so, uh, if you are taking notes, the title of my message today is stupid chores and sassy prophets, <laughs> stupid chores and sassy prophets. 
Uh, I cannot even begin to tell you guys how many fights my wife and I got in uh, with our children when they were younger over making their bed. Seems like a simple thing, right? Uh, but just like you need to do it. Look at this. It's cute Zico when he was, I don't know, tiny. Um, I don't know. Like all their age, like all these old pictures are like not the age you are now. It just seems like smaller. But um, man, this is about the age where it was just a struggle. We get into this argument with him. Um, Cohen is a little bit different. Like you tell Cohen a chore and he's just like, makes sense. This house needs to run tip top shape. I'm on it, right? You could bounce a quarter off of his bed and, and uh, you know, like his closet is perfect. But like, you know, my other two kids are more just like, you know what, if you want me to do something, you're gonna have to give me a better explanation than just like I said so, okay? I'm not, I don't, this is a stupid chore to me. I don't get it, right? Uh, he would start the chore and then get frustrated and then immediately just be like, I'm not doing it. He would get so angry and he would throw all these questions like, why do I even have to do this? This is stupid. What's the point? It doesn't matter. Who is going to come in my bedroom today besides you? Okay, like no one is going to see this. It is not hurting anyone. I'm just going to get back into it. All right, some of you are in your 50s. You're like, I have all of these same concerns. <laughs> it is a ridiculous chore, right? And yet, like, when it's your kid and you're just like, it's like the chore isn't really the point. It's like more the, the, the whole principle of the thing, like take care of yourself and make your bed, whatever. And so it's like, it's so frustrating when it's your kid and you're having this conversation because in your mind, you're just like, just do it. Just do the chore. Okay. Like I'm already tired. I, I don't want to have this fight with you, right? This argument has already taken longer than it would have taken you just to do the chore. And it's still not done. We're going to fight for 30 minutes. And then you're going to get in trouble. And you're going to take a 30-minute time out. And then we're going to go through this whole thing. And we're going to apologize and all the things. And then you are still going to have to take three minutes and make your bed. <laughs> right? The chore isn't what is wasting your time. Arguing about the chore is wasting both of our time. Right? And that is the frustrating, infuriating thing. And it's so annoying when it's a situation that is being brought to you by your kid and you're like, to just do it, right? And yet, there's part of you that kind of gets it, right? There's part of you that understands where they're coming from because you've been there. You have gotten stuck doing something that you felt was absolutely pointless. And it was annoying. Like you found yourself filling out some elaborate form at work that you knew nobody was going to read, and you still had to do it, and then they were reminding you about it, and it was just annoying because you're like, this is pointless. You have driven your kid to their 87th activity this week and sat in the car after an hour and a half drive, and you ate popcorn for dinner, and you were sitting there waiting for them to come out, and you have nothing to do, and your phone is dead, and you know they're not gonna thank you, and it just feels pointless. It feels like a waste of your time. You've agreed to volunteer at something before, right? After being harassed about doing it like 57 times, somebody has been like, you should do this. You should be a part of the thing, da, 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 da. You know, and they're telling you whether it's a soccer club or a school event or maybe even church, right? And then you're like, okay, they really need me. And you show up and then they assign you a task that you're like, a stump could do this, literally. <laughs> Why do I have to be here for this? It just feels pointless. And here's the thing. It is not unreasonable to be annoyed about these things because they're annoying. But, but some of us see just like these tasks themselves as pointless. Others of us see them as evidence that our life is pointless. When we get caught up in doing the mundane too often, the task isn't just wasting your time. It's proof that you're wasting your life. And that thought is unbearable. And it's difficult to shake. And if you carry this question around, like others are confused by why you feel this way. Because in their mind, your life is great. You have everything everyone wants. You have a comfortable life and a stable job and like a, a loving family. But somehow for you, it feels like it's just, it's not enough. Because you just feel like there ought to be more. Even though you can't, quite describe what the more is. You just, you thought your life would be bigger than this. And every milestone that you hit, 
that was supposed to be incredible, it just feels so much less impressive than you expected. You always envision yourself doing something important, you know, and, 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 and making a difference in life. But your life, if you're honest, is painfully average. Most days you feel like you're just going through the motions. And you find yourself at the end of a busy day laying awake in bed at night, wondering to yourself, do I have a purpose? Right? Does my life actually matter in the grand scheme of things? And yeah, I mean, like, you know the pushback, right? You know in your head that, like, everyone is special and we all matter and love is your purpose. Yeah, we've all seen Barney. Okay, if we get it. That's not what you're talking about, right? You are talking about something else. You're, you're talking about, like, why am I here specifically? Why did God make me? Why do I exist? Like, why am I personally here? And you want to know because you're like, I think about this all the time. I can't get it out of my head. It won't leave me alone. In fact, I wish I knew where it came from. I would have a word with those people. <laughs> And as it turns out, people with this primal question often grew up being told like they were made to do something significant in life. They were told like, you are a world changer. You're a history maker. And you're like, wow, I don't know what that means, but it seems exciting. <laughs> and it was supposed to be inspiring, but it really, honestly, it just made you feel insecure. It's left you thinking like if making a difference is what matters most, what if most of what you do doesn't make much of a difference? Does that mean that you don't matter? That question haunts you. Like, what if you squander your potential? I mean, you, you have to do something that is undeniably impactful. You know that in your gut. And I would say if you grew up in a religious household, man, the pressure was way worse. Because not only did your family expect you to do something big, so did God. Right? Not only was your worth at stake, but according to my youth pastor growing up, the eternal souls of everyone you have ever seen or met. No pressure. And everything you do, like, it starts to feel like it is, you know, infused with such enormous consequences. And if you don't rise to the occasion at all times, like, what good are you? And what is frustrating about this is, like, you're not trying to be this way. It's just sort of the way you are. You can't help it. And in all fairness, it is not all bad. Like, you are, you're passionate about doing good in the world. And when you talk about the way that the, the world could be different, people, people lean in. Like people get excited and they jump on board and they believe that it's actually possible. Like you naturally empower people to think bigger and move out of their comfort zones and take calculated risks to make a difference with their one life. And even though you can do that for other people, you're always wondering if you are doing enough to even make a dent. And sure, like, you know, you, you wish you could, you know, just do a thing without exhausting yourself to try and make it bigger and better than anyone expected it to be. You wish you could just, like, enjoy the week without wondering if maybe you sold out and are missing out on what you're really supposed to be doing instead of doing this. You wish you could, like, find the beauty in like, you know, the everyday things. You know how everybody's talking about on TikTok? Instead of being annoyed that you are wasting your life doing dishes right now. But you don't know how to do these things. Because when do I have a purpose is your primal question, you have a certain set of impulses that follow you everywhere you go. Your impulse is to feel the inescapable pressure to change the world. You live with this constant low-grade fear of not making a difference. Like other people seem content with, you know, falling in love and getting jobs and paying bills and having kids and trying to be a nice person, and that is great. But you are different. You need to leave a noticeable mark on the world. Your impulse is to believe that 
if it doesn't make a massive difference, then it doesn't really matter. Like every single one of your dreams is enormous. And everyone around you reminds you of that. Like in your mind, you're like, isn't that what a dream is? Like if it is reasonable or obtainable, that's really not a dream. <laughs> and in fact, the most infuriating thing someone could ever say to you is to listen to what you actually want to do and say like, oh, wow, what about if instead of doing that, you just came over here and did this? And you're like, mm, we can't be friends anymore. You know, like your impulse is to see small tasks as a waste of your time. And people push back and say like, but this needs to be done. And you're like, I agree, but not by me. Okay, like, I, I don't know if you know how this works, but I only have a limited time here on this earth and I do not want to waste it doing that, okay? And it's not, I'm not saying I'm better than other people. I don't think that. Like, I, I just, I only want to do things where I can have a, a maximum impact. And I got to tell you, folding these towels is not it. Okay, so <laughs> hit up somebody else. Your impulse is to feel dissatisfied with the life you have because it's not as big as you imagined it would be. I mean, your life is good. It just doesn't have the wow factor that you thought it would. And people tell you, like, you should just be grateful for what you've got, but what you've got is not really what you wanted. And it feels wrong to settle. Like, it feels like you can't. It feels like maybe it's a sin. And it's not just you who thinks this. It's all the influencers on the reels that you've watched. And you have this impulse to use escapism to cope with the averageness of your life, which is absolutely unacceptable. You think like, man, I could, maybe I could ignore the blandness of my everyday life on a vacation to there. Ooh, that would do it. Like watching this show for 30 minutes, it, it, that means that I'm not thinking about how disappointed uh, you know, I am in my story because I'm getting sucked into their story. I, I need to feel the magic of that theme park to compensate for the fact that there is a lack of magic in my actual everyday life. There's this verse about an Old Testament king that I think gets to the heart of this primal question. It's a description of somebody's life. It's, it's only a couple sentences. This is what it says. Second Chronicles Chapter 21, verse 20 says this. Jehoram was 32 when he became king. He reigned eight years. No one was sorry when he died. And I got to tell you, if this is your question, this is the thought that haunts you. That when your life is over, no one will care because you don't matter. And when I think about this question... I think of this guy from the Old Testament named Jeremiah. I think it's possible that he carried the weight of it throughout his entire life. Growing up, uh, his dad was the, the chief priest in Israel, and their society pretty much revolved around life in the temple. And so that meant that his dad was a really big deal. And when his dad died, Jeremiah, the plan was, would take over for him. And this meant that, like, you know, he was meant for big things, and everyone agreed. I mean, like, even God thought so. In fact, it says this at the beginning of his story, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, The Lord told me, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And, and I got to tell you, like, if you desperately want your life to matter— and God comes and speaks directly to you and tells you that he has a job for you that is going to impact the nations. That's pretty big. That's as big as it gets. But there is a twist in this story because God is essentially saying, like, your suspicion is right. You actually are special. But I want you to be a prophet, not a priest. And some of you are like, what is the difference? <laughs> I don't know. And, and here's the difference, right? These things couldn't be further apart. Priests, their role was to speak to God on behalf of people, but prophets spoke to people on behalf of God. 
priests, their role was to be comforting. Prophets were confrontational. Like you were born into the priesthood, but you had to be handpicked by God to be a prophet. In other words, like we see right off the bat that Jeremiah had really big plans for his own life and God had even bigger plans for him. But they weren't just big, they were different. Like what God brings to him isn't really something he was thinking about doing. Like this was totally different than the existence that he had always imagined for himself. Being a prophet was never really on his radar, but this is how God works. It still is. The truth is, God is willing to write a bigger, bolder, more beautiful story through your life than you could ever imagine. But it will require you to let go of the one you've been writing yourself. And we don't always want to do that. We're like, God, (laughs) I don't know if you know what my plans are. (laughs) I dream pretty big. And God is like, you don't know what you're talking about. In fact, one New Testament author says it this way, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. And this proves to be true in Jeremiah's life. At first, he's not really sure. Like, I don't know if I want to do that. I was sort of thinking I was always going to do this. But after a while... Like Jeremiah starts to wrap his head around and he starts to get excited about it. He starts to envision how big of an impact he's going to have on the world. And, you know, God is the one that's sending him. And so like everything obviously is going to go great because if God is with you, everything's going to be smooth sailing. And that did not happen. Okay, it did not really work out like that. Jeremiah genuinely tries to do what God is asking him to to carry his message to the people, but guess what? The people don't listen. And they don't just ignore him, they belittle him and beat him. And then come the death threats. And Jeremiah gets mad at God. I mean, wouldn't you? Jeremiah 13, verse 10, he's venting to God and he says, these wicked people refuse to listen to me. They stubbornly follow their own desires and worship other gods. Therefore, they will become like this loincloth, good for nothing. And God is like, I hear you. But why did you ditch the loincloth? That is the thing I can't figure out. Now you're just a naked guy at a prayer meeting. And that is weird. It's unnecessary. It's uncomfortable for the rest of the attendees. And I think for the Holy Spirit. And so maybe just throw some pants on. One cloths are necessary. Maybe just a knife box, box or brief, something. Then Jeremiah goes on to say this in chapter 20, verse 7. He says, God, you misled me, and I let it happen. You overpowered me, and now everyone laughs at me. And this is really what Jeremiah is saying. God, you lied to me. You manipulated me. You were the one who put this dream inside of me, Why would you do that? Like, you knew this was going to happen. I wanted to change the world. And you got my hopes up, and then you let me waste my life. I didn't even want to do this. You were the one that suggested it to me. And I thought we had a deal. You know, it wasn't supposed to be like this. And I wonder if you have ever been here. I think a lot of times we think when we give our life to Christ that he's obligated to make our life easier. But God's goal is not to make your life easy, it's to make it meaningful. And as it turns out, every impactful, influential, and inspiring story involves struggle and suffering. But just because that's true doesn't mean we like it. Jeremiah didn't like it. And he lets God know just how much he doesn't like it a few verses later. This is Jeremiah 20. Verse 14, this is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Verse 14, I curse the day I was born. May no one celebrate the day of my birth. I curse the messenger who told my father, good news, you have a son. Let him be destroyed like the cities of old that the Lord overthrew without mercy. Terrify him all day long with battle shouts because he did not kill me at birth. Oh, that I had died 
in my mother's womb that her body had been my grave. Why was I even born? My entire life has been filled with trouble and sorrow and shame. Does this sound like it was written by a teenager? <laughs> this is so, there's so much drama. You're like, man, so much drama packed into so few sentences. And it is dramatic. It's very overly dramatic, especially when you compare where this story started to where it is at right now, right? Like if you think back in chapter one, his story opens with God saying like, listen, I am the one who made you. I chose you for this before you were even born. And by chapter 20, Jeremiah is like, I don't like the way you made me. I don't like what you chose for me. Like if this is all that my life was ever gonna be, I would rather have just not been born. Because Jeremiah, he wanted whatever God did through him to feel big while he was doing it and seem significant the moment it was done. That's why he's upset. But that's really how it works. And if you expect this too, then you are going to be upset, as upset as he was. Because when it comes to purpose, like here is the reality. If your sense of purpose depends on an outcome, it's shallow. And if your level of significance is determined by success, it's hollow. But when those things are embedded in who you're becoming, they're unshakable. Which is good news, because as it turns out, outcomes are out of your control. Have you noticed this yet? A lot of success is contextual and circumstantial, meaning not up to you. At the end of the day, your purpose is being who God created you to be, not doing something extraordinary. And yet when you carry this question, you feel like you have blown your purpose if you have not done something extraordinary. And God is thinking, who put that on you? It wasn't me. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, the Apostle Paul writes this. I think this is such incredible advice for all of us, but especially if this is your question. He says, wholeheartedly work at whatever you do as though you're doing it for God himself. And I gotta tell you, this is a tough thought for a lot of us to wrap our mind around because some of us, especially if this is our primal question, we only wanna wholeheartedly work at big things. But when we do whatever we're doing, like it's a big deal, it becomes a big deal. So stop chasing the next big thing and just do the next right thing. Because in reality, the biggest thing you can do with your life is to show up to the small everyday moments of your actual life and fully live them. Amen. Instead of putting your life on pause because what is in front of you is way too small for you to do. I think this is something that Jeremiah had to learn and something that God wants to teach you too. What I think is interesting about Jeremiah's life is that he never had the level of impact that he hoped for on the people around him in the world that he lived in. But he wasn't called to outcomes, he was called to obedience. And because he understood this, he kept showing up and he kept giving his best, even though he felt like a lot of the time that what God had asked him to do seemed pointless and meaningless and worthless. But it wasn't. And the people of his day might not have really listened to him. But that was then. Now, his are some of the most famous and influential words in all of scripture. Even if you're not a church person, you know Jeremiah. You've been impacted by his life. 
by his faith, by his small steps of faithfulness that seemed fruitless when he originally took them. Jeremiah wrote this. You already know this. Some of you have this inscribed and stitched into a pillow on the couch at your house or stenciled above your fireplace. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for good and not disaster to give you hope and a future. Isn't it ironic that the person who writes these words to be taken to heart by each of us were written by someone who spent his entire life doubting the plans God had for him. I think some of the best sermons that get preached are the ones that the preachers preach to themselves. And this is something that Jeremiah is saying to him on behalf of God. But you're welcome to listen in. I think it's interesting that because I think he felt the weight of this question that Jeremiah sometimes regretted that he'd been born, but I, I don't regret that he'd been born. He sometimes wondered if he'd wasted his life, but I, I don't. He assumed that nothing he did would ever make much difference, but I don't think that. He feared that his life was way too small, but I don't think that. And here's the thing that I want you to internalize today. I think this is a good lesson for all of us, but especially if this is your primal question. The reality is God often invites people to do something small, but he never asks anyone to do anything insignificant. God does not give out insignificant assignments. You just may not be able to see the impact he intends for it to have. And here's the reality. It may not have the impact that God intends for it unless you lean into it. God is going to do the things that he wants to do. The question is not that. The question is, are you going to get to be a part of it? And oftentimes the way that he's inviting us to be a part of it is not the big thing we imagine, but the small step we don't want to take. The mundane task we don't want to be assigned. So much of the time this is where the magic happens. And so here's your homework. If this is your question, I want to challenge you that when you are tempted to believe that your life is pointless and the things you do are meaningless, Remind yourself that if you wholeheartedly work at whatever God puts in front of you, he'll do something significant through you. I wonder how your life would shift if you began to tell yourself this on a regular basis. Because this is not probably the internal monologue that you have going. As you step into something that seems pointless, mundane, repetitive, annoyingly average, you're like, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. This is not what my life is supposed to be about. This is dumb. I'm wasting my time. And because you tell yourself that, you phone in the thing that you're doing and you miss out on the thing that God wants to do through it. I wonder what would happen is in these moments where you stepped up to whatever God was calling you to do that was right in front of you, maybe felt a little too small for you and what you had intended. You tell yourself like, man, if I wholeheartedly work at this thing that I'm believing God put in front of me, he is going to do something significant through me. I'm going to give it my best because I'm doing it for God. And if this is somebody else's question, somebody that you know or live near or are close with, when they're struggling to believe that life is purposeful and their efforts are meaningful, help them to zoom out and see how big an impact the small things they do are having on real people. Here's the reality. The people in your life that, that feel this way and begin to sort of implode, it's because they have reached a point where they are incapable of connecting the dots. And just sort of generically being like, no, your life does matter. Here's the question they're going to ask you. How? Why? This is important. How? Why? They're not being difficult. It's a real question. And when you can sit down and say, here's the thing you don't realize. When you do this and you invest in that, this is the ripple effect that it's having and here's how it's impacting real people. 
I know you can't see it right now, but this is a big deal, even though it's such a small thing. There's some of you that wonder about your purpose because you are caught up doing small things. And yet God is like, no, 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 that's not evidence that I don't have something big for you. The fact that I gave you this small thing that needs to be done on such a high level means I trust you more than anyone. What are you gonna do with the little moments? Because that's where all of the difference is made. And I wanna pray this into your life today. Would you bow your heads across this room? God, I know you see our lives. I know you know what we go through. You made us and you made us to crave living life on purpose for a purpose. And some of us, man, we, we, we just have such a hard time identifying, what, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? I, 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 we, we get caught up in thinking about like all these little things and getting in our head and just believing that like nothing we do is adding up to anything. God, you, you, you got me excited about the potential impact I could have, but like I can only see it unfolding one way and it's not working out that way right now. And God, I pray that we would trust you, that we would lean into you, that anything and everything you put in front of us, we would see as an opportunity to give our best, to honor you, to demonstrate your grace and your mercy and your creativity and your excellence and your love. Whether it's changing yet another diaper, doing another dish, filling out another report, whether it's driving somebody else on an errand that you don't wanna run, God, whatever the thing is that we have downgraded, may we see it through your eyes and may you give us the ability to understand the power and the purpose in leaning into the little things, and doing them as if they are big things. And because we do, they become big things because your power is behind them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said Amen.